In college, when I was a freshman, I took a class called the History of Religion. And in this class, we studied Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, we focused mainly on those two religions. And in the very first class, we talked about the important role that meditation plays in both of these religions. And after that first lecture, we went off to our first discussion section. And there, our TA told us that meditation really is an important part of both of these religions. And so he said that in order to, for us to really understand what meditation is, we were going to meditate for our first class discussion. So he had us all close our eyes and try our best to think about nothing. Which, I'll have you know if you've never tried it before, is extremely, extremely difficult to think about nothing. Because when you're told to think about nothing, your mind automatically wants to think of something. And so he gave us, I think, it seemed like an eternity, but it was probably about 15 minutes out of 50 minutes. Um, and uh, I probably spent the first 14 minutes uh, thinking about other stuff. Uh, but toward the last minute, I was finally able to somewhat empty my mind and come the closest I've ever come to thinking about nothing. And what I was thinking was, oh, this is pretty relaxing. I kind of like this. Well, at 15 minutes, he said, all right, well, what did you guys think? And uh, some people said, you know, that was, a, that was a really spiritual experience. Man, that was, that was such a spiritual experience. And I didn't answer, but I thought to myself, you guys are weird. Um, there was nothing spiritual about that. It was uh, the closest thing to a nap that I ever had in a discussion <laughs> section. <laughs> well, we talk about meditation in Christianity, too. But meditation in Christianity is not about emptying your mind. In fact, it's just the opposite. Christian meditation is about filling your mind with something. The command to um, fill your mind is all over Scripture, but you will never find anywhere in Scripture the command to empty your mind. Turn over to Psalm chapter 1. This, I think, really encapsulates the biblical concept of meditation, the biblical concept of thinking on something. Psalm chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 2. Very familiar words for those of you who are familiar with Scripture. Psalm chapter 1, starting in verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor seat, uh, sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. In Christianity, you meditate on something. You think about something. You use your brain to process something. The word of God. We are to think over what God's word means, how it applies to us, and how we can implement what it says on a daily basis. We'll turn over to Philippians chapter 4, and we'll continue our study of the book of Philippians. Today we're going to see what God has to say about thinking. And so today, as we study this passage, we're going to think about thinking. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 to 9. Finally, brethren... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. We have eight virtues in verse 8 and the key phrase is found at the end of the verse. Dwell on these things. It's interesting that Paul doesn't command us to do these things. He doesn't command us to become these things. He doesn't command us to practice these things. He commands us to think on these things, to dwell on them, to spend extended time thinking about them. Process these things. Evaluate these things. Think about the implications of these things. To have deliberate, prolonged contemplation on these virtues. Paul's saying, make godly thinking your habit. 
The mind matters in Christianity. Your thinking matters. It matters probably more than you even understand. It's all over scripture. And let me just give you a small sample. Believe me, this is a small sample of how much the Bible talks about your brain, about how much the Bible talks about your thinking. Proverbs 4, 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. The Hebrew concept of the heart was really the concept of the mind. The springs of life flow from your mind. Mark 12, 30, the words of Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Loving God is a matter of the mind. The way you think can be a way that you love God. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We're saved by hearing the gospel, which means that we listen to it, we process it, and we respond to an intellectual understanding of the gospel. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. These two verses tell us that your mind is capable of worship and that renewing your mind is an act of worship to God. Ephesians 4.23 says something similar. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Colossians 3.2 Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. We are to examine. We are to scrutinize things. We are to think about them so that we make the right decisions, so that we make decisions that honor the Lord. 1 Peter 1.13 Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare your minds. Gird them up for correct action, for actions that honor God. Your actions are going to flow directly from what you think. 1 Peter 3.15 But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and and reverence. We are to be ready to give a logical, reasonable response why we believe what we believe. If people ask us why you're a Christian, we're to give them a coherent, rational explanation for why we believe in God. Martin Lloyd Jones sums this idea up well the importance of the mind. He says, Faith is primarily thinking. And the whole trouble with man, who has little faith, is that he does not think. He allows circumstances to bludgeon him. We must spend more time in studying our Lord's lessons in observation and deduction. The Bible is full of logic, and we must never think of faith as something purely mystical. We do not just sit down in an armchair and expect marvelous things to happen. That is not Christian faith. Christian faith is essentially thinking. Look at the birds. Think about them. Draw your deductions. Look at the grass. Look at the lilies of the field. Consider them. Faith, if you like, can be defined by this. It is a man insisting upon thinking when something seems determined to bludgeon and knock him down in an intellectual sense. The trouble with the person of little faith is that instead of controlling his own thought, his thought is being controlled by something else. And as we put it, he goes round and round in circles. Today I want to present two imperatives for godly living. Two imperatives for godly living. Two commands, two things to follow so that we become more godly, more Christ-like people. And the first has to do with thinking. First, set your mind on godly virtues Set your mind on godly virtues. Verse 8. If 
Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. We see eight virtues here. Let's take them one by one. First, whatever is true. God's word is truth. John 17, 17. Uh, Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Dwelling on what's true means dwelling on the Bible. It means to read the Bible. It means to read the Bible and to reread the Bible and then to reread the Bible. It means to pray over verses. It means to memorize it. It means to read it multiple times a day. And it also includes... Uh, dwelling on anything else that is true. Uh, to think upon what is true means that you reject irrational thinking, that you're guided by your thinking, uh, your rational thinking, instead of your emotions. Secondly, whatever is honorable. Uh, this word is used in the pastoral epistles to describe the qualifications of elders. It's often um, translated as dignified. Elders in that uh, Contexts are to be honorable and worthy of respect. They should act in a way that is worthy of honor. Third, uh, whatever is right. The Greek word uh, here is the one used for justice or righteousness. Things that reflect the righteousness or justice of God. Whatever is in harmony with God's unchanging eternal standard for what is just and what is right. We are to think about those things, fill our minds with those things. Whatever is pure, and you don't have to think very hard to come up with an example of something that is impure in our society. Um, if you just drive down the street, oftentimes you'll see a billboard that is impure. You turn on the television, you'll oftentimes see something that is impure. You don't have to go very far to find something impure. We must stay away from lust-inducing temptation. Now, when you sin, you can almost all the time, almost every single time, you can trace it back to some impure thought that you had. And the time that you put something impure into your mind, you didn't think that it affected you. But later down the line, maybe weeks later, it causes you to stumble into sin. Whatever is lovely, that means whatever is pleasing, attractive, winsome, whatever is of good repute, whatever is commendable, what is highly spoken of by other people. Uh, when I think about this one, I think about uh, movies that come out these days that are comedies. And I'm pretty surprised at what people will watch these days, uh, the things that they find funny. Uh, scatological humor, uh, jokes about bodily functions. I mean, honestly, that's the kind of stuff that I think seventh grade boys like but if you look at the statistics everybody's watching these movies everybody's entertained by these things men and women alike and finally if there's any excellence or anything worthy of praise uh, this sums up the other six virtues if you'll notice these eight characteristics describe God Paul is saying, fill your mind with the excellence and perfections of God. If there's something that is like God, that reflects God's character, then think about those things. Fill your minds with those things. Now, we've talked about what we can do to fill our minds with the right stuff, right? Reading the Bible, memorizing it, um, dwelling on it, meditating on it, rereading it over and over again. But let's talk now about the things that we should not be putting into our mind. And again, I'm going to talk about entertainment, uh, the media. Um, I'm going to give you guys a list of some TV shows that are popular. And all I'm doing, I'm not condemning these TV shows. All I'm doing is asking you guys to compare these shows, especially if you watch them, against this list. Because if you're watching these shows and they do not reflect the character of God, if they don't match this list, then you're basically dwelling on that for half an hour. Uh, maybe half an hour a week. So I'm just asking, 
I'm not condemning. Uh, some of these shows I've watched and been convicted, <laughs> and uh, some of them I know are bad, and some of them I don't really know because I uh, haven't really watched them. Here's the list. Modern Family. Family Guy. The Simpsons. Saturday Night Live. The Cleveland Show. Desperate Housewives. This one's gonna hurt. You guys got your seatbelt buckled? The Office. I'm just asking. Just asking. American Dad. All the late night shows. Conan O'Brien, The Daily Show, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Jay Leno. There are probably some that I missed, but you guys get the point. There's an old Southern Baptist saying, um, if the preacher gets out of line, people in the congregation will say, Preacher, you've done stop preaching and gone to meddling. <laughs> and perhaps I am meddling right now, but I'm also preaching. I'm asking you guys to use discernment uh, when you guys decide what television shows you watch. Um, the reason I didn't go after movies is because I haven't seen a movie in so long. I don't know what's out there. Um, but the principle still applies. Use discernment. You want to know the filter to filter it through? Philippians 4.8. Uh, the second imperative for godly um, action, for living a godly life, <coughs> is to imitate the example of godly people. Imitate the example of godly people. Follow their example. Verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. <clears throat> when Paul was with the Philippians, they saw how he faced trials. They saw how he preached the gospel. They probably walked in on his tent when he was reading the scriptures. They probably walked in on him praying. They saw his example. They saw the kind of life that he lived. He preached to them. He taught them, much like I'm doing now probably on a regular basis. And here he's calling the Philippians to follow his example, to recall back to when he was actually with them and to imitate his godly behavior. Uh, this call to imitate godly examples is not new in the book of Philippians. We've seen this already. Hopefully this is ringing a bell. Philippians 3.17. If you want to flip there, you can refresh your memory. Paul writes to the Philippians, Brother Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Here Paul is exhorting the Philippians to imitate himself, Epaphroditus, Timothy, and anyone else who lives their lives like they do. Now when we went over that verse, we talked about getting a discipler, uh, which I'm very encouraged to hear that many of you have. In fact, some of you have come up to me and asked me to find you a discipler. That's great. It's a great first step. But I'll take it one step further. It's not enough just to have a discipler. Someone asks you, who are you being discipled by? It's not enough just to say, oh, it's him. And you feel good about yourself. Your conscience is at ease. It's not, just to, good, it's not good enough just to have a discipler. What this verse is exhorting us to do is to cultivate a deep relationship with that discipler. To spend as much time as you can with that discipler. Read verse 9 again. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Learned, received, heard, seen. It means you have to be around your discipler if you're going to do all those things. Uh, verse 9 implies a close relationship with the people who you consider to be godly examples. You gotta let them teach you. You gotta receive their instruction. You gotta hear them. You gotta see them. You gotta be around them. And those of you who are disciples, are you available? Do you realize that your role is not just a Bible teacher? Uh, small group leaders, you guys are not just Bible teachers. You guys are examples to the flock of God. You are to invite people into your lives so that they can see how you live. If you practice the things that 
Paul did and that godly examples do, there is a promise. The end of verse 9. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. God's very presence, which brings peace, will be with you. In verse 7, if you recall, we have the promise of the peace of God. And now we have the promise of the God of peace. If he is with you, if he is near you, as in verse 5, then you will have peace. Live a holy life by following godly examples, and then you, experience, you will experience this peace in your life. And as we learned last week, you might not be able to explain how you get this peace because it surpasses understanding. It's simply given to you by God. So we have these two imperatives for godly living. Set your mind on godly virtues and imitate the example of godly people.